Okay, we're ready to go, Chair. Yeah, thank you. Good afternoon, councillors, colleagues, officers, members of the public and press. Welcome to this meeting of the Outbreak Control Engagement Working Group. This meeting is a remote meeting and it's being live streamed and recorded. I'll now pass it over to Democratic Services team for a roll call. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Good afternoon, members. I'll just run through a roll call of those present today and if you can let me know as well that if you've received the agenda papers for the meeting. So, Councillor Moore? Uh, present and have the relevant paperwork. Thank you. Councillor Thomas? Yes, present enough. Uh, I have the papers. Thank you. Councillor Harrison? Yes, I'm present and have the papers. Thank you. We have apologies from Denise McGuckin. Uh, Dr. Tim Butler? No. Michael Howell? No. We have apologies from Leslie Wharton. Craig <coughs> Lundred? Yes, I'm present, but I don't have the papers. I haven't been sent them by the look. We'll get we'll get some email through to you, Craig. Sally Robinson. No. Uh, Superintendent Cooney. Is that um, Peter Graham? Yes, apologies for Sharon Cooney. It's um, Peter Graham, and I have the papers. Thank you. Okay, Peter, thank you. We have apologies from Jill Harrison. I believe Gemma Patak is joining this afternoon. I can see Gemma is yes, online. Yes, I'm, I'm present and I have the information. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Tony Hansen. Thanks, David, and I've got everything. <clears throat> Thank you. We have apologies from Ed Turner. Christopher Akers Belcher. Present and I have the papers. Thank you. Julian Penton. Uh, present with papers. Thank you. And looking at the other representatives, Jacqueline McKenzie. No. Fiona Adamson. No. Graham Trory. No. Carl Parker. No. Okay. Thank you. That uh, concludes the roll call, Chair. Thank, Thank you, you, David. Um, agenda item one, are there any apologies that haven't already been declared or is there anybody else here today who um, uh, is participating but wasn't included in the roll call? There is Council. Yeah, Council Tony Richardson has joined us, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, okay. If you people can have a look at at the uh, minutes from the meeting on the 10th of November, um, if there are any questions or comments on those minutes, if you, anybody could raise them now. Okay, so people are minded, we'll take those as uh, read and without any issues, thank you. Uh, next item then, um, coronavirus in Hartlepool, a data update um, from the Director of Public Health. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, great, we've got the slides up there as well. Thanks, Joan. Uh, yeah, just to give a, a, an update as to the current position where we're actually at in terms of um, COVID for Hartlepool. I think it's fair to say, uh, if you can move on to the next slide, please. Um, we've had, uh, again, the rate is started to decline uh, somewhat, I think. If we go to the next slide, actually, I think we'll talk about that first uh, from that. Yep. As you can see from the, the figures there, uh, we've got the England rate at the top and the Hartlepool rate at the bottom graphs there. You can see um, we're starting to see a decline in the number of cases as we go through. I think that's probably the only good news I have today, but it is some, some good news um, that we have, you know, we're seeing the the, the, the effects of lockdown um, <coughs> filtering through into the, the population. I think early indications from the, the, the most up-to-date data seem to suggest that we may have gone through the 200, um, gone below the 200 cases per 100,000 uh, in the last couple of days um, for the seven-day rolling average, which is very positive news. Um, and I think, as I say, we're seeing the effect of the lockdown really um, coming in there. And as you can see at the bottom graph there showing the Hartlepool cases, we did have a large spike before we went in uh, and we've been able to, to, to get the, the numbers of cases down quite significantly. 
what I would say, and as an issue a note of caution, is um, whilst we have broken through that 200 per 100,000, that still is quite a, a high rate. We were um, earlier this week uh, around about the 30th um, highest rate in the country and um, certainly the highest rate in the northeast. So we aren't out of the woods yet. We do still have um, a number of problems with the, the number of cases that we have. Uh, one thing to mention when we, we talk about this, and we'll be looking at the tiers and, and where we are with the tiers as well, is to bear in mind that they've actually changed their criteria for moving between the tiers. So it's not just the actual case rates that we're interested in. It's a much rounded, rounded picture, a more detailed picture uh, of, of what's being assessed. And I'll come on to that at the end of the presentation as well, <coughs> just to finish that up. But it's it we are in a positive place at the moment, and I think we we you know the 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 residents have put in an awful lot of work to get to this point in time and and sacrifice, and I think um, you know we should really give credit to people for that, and I think we just re remember that we we've just got to keep going to to keep these numbers down and keep them falling. So can we go to the next slide, please? It's just another illustration of the the rates, just to show the seven day and fourteen day rolling averages, to show that you know it has been quite a dramatic. It's probably easier to see there that it's a, 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 the more dramatic fall that we've been seeing uh, in the in the data there. Can we have the next slide, please? Obviously, of course, we, the 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 death rate is a, a, a lagging indicator, and this shows the um, the the death rate over the course of the pandemic, and again shows that um, Hartlepool has been tracking higher than the the England rate, um, pretty well nearly all of the the, the time through the pandemic, um, and again it is concerning, obviously, but um, you know we we expect that because of the the you know underlying rates of illness and, and deprivation we have in Hartlepool. Um, but it is slowing as well at the moment, uh, and I think that's a reflection of the the reduction in case cases as well. Can we have the next slide, please? Again, um, I think we've seen this slide before. We're still seeing the same pattern in the the, the spread of um, COVID throughout the population. That's for for the month of November, showing that it is where we would expect it to be in those areas of highest population. Um, certainly, we can identify some hot spots there, which were identified as um, certainly in the north of the town. You can see in, in around Seaton Carew, um, and we we are able to identify cases in those areas and, and look at why some of the reasons why we might be experiencing some of those hot spots as well, which is helpful with some of the data we get on a, on a regular basis. Uh, if we can have the next slide, please. This just gives an indication of the density of the numbers of tests we have. And it's interesting, as you can see from the previous slide, um, some of those areas where we had high numbers of cases, we don't have high levels of testing, which seems to suggest we need to, to do a bit more work there in terms of increasing the numbers of people we test just to um, in those areas, because I think that that um, may actually identify more cases, which will uh, enable us to um, put in measures to, to help people to, to isolate and prevent the transmission of disease. So it's quite interesting, the, the, the densities there uh, and looking at that. Can I have the next slide, please? That's just an indication of the settings, um, care homes and and the like, and uh, other residential dwellings we see as the the highest number of cases we we have in the um, community. Can we have the next slide, please? As I mentioned before, we're we're looking at the COVID uh, tiers and how we come in into and out of the tiers. Uh, what's taken into account are the not just the rates and the rate per hundred thousand, but also uh, the rates in the over 60s and positivity rates and various um, factors related to that data. So it's a rounded picture rather than a, a very specific rate. It does make it a little more complicated to work out where we might be likely to be in terms of tiers, but it's um, it does take into account more of those um, factors that are having more of an impact on the community. So um, those are from November and December, which shows that we have had a, a quite a significant reduction in our rate. But again, as I said before, I think that's actually, um, you know, positive, but not enough to, to really, I think, bring us down to the rates we really want to see to get us out, out of tier three. The over 60s rates come down very considerably um, since um, November the 6th to December the 5th. Um, that's really good going, I think, as well, because obviously the over 60s are, are more vulnerable. And, and um, you know, that's the reason that they're identified separately within this. The other areas are looking at the, the hospital rates as well. 
uh, the rates of hospitalisation of people with COVID. Uh, and again, I think that's um, that's quite um, quite high at the moment. I think particularly for our local trusts. Uh, was that the last slide, Joan? I think is there another one? Oh no, there's another one there with the metrics on. Uh, but again, that gives an indication. It's what we like to see, which is um, the figures are in the green. Uh, the positivity is coming down uh, and the number of people who the proportion of people rather who test positive uh, is reducing, um, which is a positive thing for us. Um, and again, as I say, is looked at again, 10.4 percent is high. Um, and I think really we, we do need to get that down uh, quite a lot further. And again, it shows there that we are higher in than um, the, the rest of the Tees Valley, northeastern England as well. However, it is moving in the right direction. Uh, next slide. I think that's the last slide, isn't it? Yeah. I think just as as part of this presentation, I think also to 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 really sort of have a look at the forward view as to where we're potentially going as well. I think um, some of the key issues um, that we're facing, um, you know, we, it's really positive that we're seeing those rates falling, but we do have to take into account we've got Christmas coming up. And I think uh, the concerns around uh, potentially people mixing more and coming together more. And whilst it's, um, you know, it might seem like a really good thing to do at Christmas, I think we all need to remember to maintain distancing um, for the, for the you know, well, for the available future, really, because I think we are in this um, still for the long haul, despite the vaccine coming online. And I think despite the, the you know, the, the possibilities of meeting up with people at Christmas, we really don't want to see those figures spiking again particularly after christmas um with uh, you know as we head into the, the 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 real peak winter time as well so i think really the messaging we want to put out is that we need to to continue with the social distancing continue with the measures and and really take that uh, on board for the foreseeable future you know there is light at the end of the tunnel but we don't really want to let our guard down so it's a bit of a, a bit of a downer message after I'm afraid, unfortunately, after some of the positive, more positive messages with the figures. But I do think it's important to to reflect that and to 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 really illustrate that we aren't out of the woods yet, despite that some of the positive news. Thank you, Craig. And I, if I just add to that, um, just an hour or so ago, I got off a call um, with Minister Luke Hall and the other Tees Valley, uh, not just Norton start again not just Tees Valley but Northeast leaders and mayors um, it was really useful uh, they went through the the uh, metrics for the whole of the Northeast with us as well as the uh, the, the fact that we know the local Tees Valley uh, I will say that we pushed extremely hard for the case for the Tees Valley especially um, as Craig said there the indicators are all showing uh, improvement uh, and in their own words uh, very good improvements in in many areas they did clarify that when looking at um, hospital admissions and cases uh, they shouldn't be looking at individual hospitals or hospital trusts because clearly there are other hospitals around in which patients can be transferred and moved um, and so they shouldn't look at each individual hospital in isolation um, but we really stressed home and pushed home the message sorry that uh, our people have done extremely well they've done everything that they've asked uh, they've been asked to do over the past month or so as, as a local authority we've done that as well and what we wouldn't like to see and what we've we've asked for reassurance is that we appreciate the christmas period is coming up and there's going to be this five day break where everybody can effectively go out see their, their family and friends and i i would uh, echo craig's concerns that people still need to be vigilant and and um and to think about what they're doing but that was a political decision by the government to allow those five days and what they can't do now is penalize local authorities like ours um, for doing the right thing over the past six weeks or more um, because they're worried about what might happen after christmas because otherwise my real concern is we'll lose the trust and the the respect of the public because they will um, no longer listen because they'll see the goalposts to move to time after time um, Christopher. Thank you, Chair. It, it was just to pick up on some of the messaging because I remember when we first set up, like, you know, this outbreak control group and I said that there was an offer there, you know, from Health Watch to do some of the messaging and I, we have such a, a, a large reach and I know the council has been putting out, like, you know, leaflets in every single household so there may not have been a need but obviously given our reach, I would like, you know, urge 
you know, bearing in mind we are a commissioned service by the local authority and one of the parameters that we are measured on is signposts and information and guidance. And I just feel as if, like, you know, as a member within the council's toolkit of having Health Watch and Hartley pulled in order to promote that information. And I would just urge the council to actually use that facility, bearing in mind, like, you know, we are a service that's commissioned by the council to do that. And just we could, like, you know, reinforce some of the messaging. And I'm not playing down the messaging that's already been done by the local authority because it's absolutely excellent, the messaging that's going out. But obviously not everybody has access to the mediums that are being used and they can all we deal with some people who are seldom heard some marginalized communities and would like to like put that offer back on the table if you can contact us so we can promote that they can all given that we're in a quite a precarious situation and everyone's chomping at the bit to get out of tier three and into tier two I never thought i'd hear the day you know i'd be saying i'm looking forward to being in tier two but we are thank you that's great. Thank you, uh, Christopher. Officers, we'll, we'll be able to uh, to feed in with uh, the partner agencies a bit more, please, and take that in. Great. Uh, Councillor Harrison. Thanks, um, Shane. Um, yeah, I, I'd echo what Christopher said about messaging. I think it's really important to get to as many people um, as, as we can. Uh, but I think it depends very much on what the message is. And, and I would actually um, stress that I think that the five days over Christmas um, is irresponsible. I think it's uh, something which um, is appealing to the public's, uh, you know, that they, they want to um, be popular over Christmas. And, and I just really do think that we have to be really vigilant. Um, being in tier three, I suppose, helps that vigilance. But the idea of going and seeing family and friends, it has to be on a much reduced scale. Um, I, I mean, there will be some families who won't meet, us being one. Um, so I'm not saying anything that I won't be doing myself. And I, and I think it is sad, but it's even sadder if this virus is spread over Christmas even more, um, and, and then we pay the price over, you know, in, in the new year. I think we have to be extremely vigilant, and I think the message has to be very clear as to what you can do and what you can't do. Um, and I think that we all probably have different opinions as to what that is. Um, so I think we need a, a commonality. I mean, if, if you look at various programs on the television, for example, Question Time last night, there was a, a completely um, huge range of opinions as to whether we should be um, do, doing what we're doing anyway. And, and this is from, um, you know, from people in government to people um, in uh, a journalist position. And I can't remember her name, but she's a, an older woman who should know a lot better. And she was just completely off the wall as far as um, her, her opinions are concerned. So it, we do need to get a common opinion um, as to what the best way forward is and to get that message across. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Councillor Harrison. Any other questions or comments? Uh, Craig, just on, on, on the point that Brenda just raised there, um, can I just say the uh, letter that, you, I don't know if it went out to all schools, but certainly one came out from St. Helens yesterday, the day before, um, a joint letter from yourself and Sally, um, which detailed uh, the, well, as Councillor Harrison was saying there, the importance of bubbles and what you can and can't do over Christmas. And to be honest, I thought that that was really well written and it was um, uh, really useful. That's good news. Um, yeah. yeah, good. Thanks. Yeah, I think it was, uh, and Sally wrote um, that as as well. I think it was. Um, it's really just to, to reiterate those messages. I think, and and those are the the messages we want to get out. And as I said, I know it's it's, a, it's probably an unpopular view um, to do that and and to to ask people to restrict their their contact with others. But I do think that we are likely to see, given the 
um, the, the figures I've just shown you in that spike uh, we had just yeah. before the lockdown. We want to avoid that at all costs uh, happening after Christmas. Uh, and my worry is that that will happen again if, um, you know, we have such widespread mixing over the Christmas period. So, you know, it is crucial that the messaging goes out that we don't want to um, to, to see that. And, you know, it's it's a small sacrifice now for, for very big gains Absolutely. in the future. Absolutely. And it's it's popular with me, Craig. <laughs> thank you, Craig. Uh, Sally? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to confirm that that letter has been distributed to all schools with the encouragement for them to distribute it. So I do hope um, that it goes out to all the families in the town. Uh, and I know parallel to that, schools were also sending their own uh, letters as well. So hopefully we're reinforcing those messages uh, repeatedly. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Sally. I've got really Stephen. Cool. Sorry, I haven't got a surname for you, Stephen. Hello, Chair. It's Stephen oh, Thomas. It's Stephen Thomas. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> That's OK. Uh, yeah, Craig, it's just um, we've seen this week uh, the start of the rollout of the vaccine. And I just wonder if you can update us on uh, the progress that's being made with that and the plans uh, for taking that forward. And particularly uh, with our most vulnerable residents and uh, with uh, people in care homes and care settings and our health and care workers. Uh, I can have a small amount of information because I think that's being driven through NHS England and the CCG, uh, and I'm not sure if there's anyone from those representatives on the the meeting today. Um, but I think that yes, you're right. They have just started, and I think they are targeting the, uh, as I'm aware, the over 80s and and some health and social care workers and also care home staff as well. And I think they they have to started calling those in at the moment i think it's uh, to be honest it's an ever-changing picture as to to what's happening with that as well so you would be better off getting uh, an update and i'll see if i can arrange for for something to come to you from uh, the ccg and nhs england on on what the actual current position is because uh, i know they are due to start some some additional rollout in the next week or so chair can we arrange for that uh, update to go out uh, to all members and yes. I think certainly for the next outbreak control meeting uh, the vaccination program needs to have someone who can uh, give a full update from the health side. Yeah absolutely. Thank you very much. There's nobody else? Okay thank you Craig. Um, we'll move on to uh, item four, COVID-19 community champions. Um, I think that's you up, Gemma. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I've got a short presentation to um, just try and articulate some of the detail around this, so bear with me. Um, apologies. Not working. It's the pressure. There we go. Um, so th this is a, a, a reasonably new um, concept in, in respect of uh, community COVID champions, but I, I'm just hopefully going to set the scene a little bit in terms of how that fits in um, and what some of the proposals are. Um, as I say, this is very um, early days, but as we know, we've we've had a community kind of response to um, the COVID-19 pandemic um, and we've we've got a number of services that are operating in the community in partnership with a, a broad range of colleagues, especially those within the voluntary and community sector. So we've got the support hub um, that I'll uh, give much more detail on in my next report, but obviously that's um, to support those most vulnerable people, especially linked to um, those that are clinically extremely vulnerable, um, isolating or critically vulnerable. Um, and that's being able to provide them with what they need um, throughout these challenging times. We've also implemented a program called Community Street Ambassadors, um, and this has been a group of people out and responding to um, some of the, the areas of need, um, providing reassurance to um, the community. Um, they've often been deployed around our retail areas, our parks and open spaces. Um, more recently, we've been supporting outside schools um, and businesses, um, and, and that's going really well. Um, 
just an indication we've had um the last week's report um identified we'd had um 749 contacts with people um and that was to provide um information advice guidance reassurance um and and lots of other things in between so they're kind of eyes and ears on the ground for us to be able to also bring information back um, to be able to inform um, the, the authority around kind of future service design um, and, and really be kind of a, a presence for the community to see. We're hoping to add an additional strand to that. Um, so we're proposing to um, implement community COVID champions. Um, and this would be looking at working and um, empowering local residents um, and employees of, of organisations and students um, to be able to have the right information and knowledge and then share that further with their, their colleagues, their friends and their family. Um, and that would obviously be evolving as we see the national and local picture change. Um, there would be a, an element of informal training and information sharing that would go with that. Um, and we've done quite a lot of national scoping. What we're seeing is that this is working really well in other areas. Um, and what they have is a, a weekly webinar where people can come, share information, ask questions, feedback. Um, and it's actually giving really um, rich insight that perhaps we wouldn't get otherwise. Um, there'll be um, contact via other mechanisms and we would use some of the, the digital um, options available to us um, and again there's a huge amount of information management already available and we would ensure that that would be available to uh, to people that needed it. Um, we would roll this out in partnership with colleagues at Hartley Power and um, some of our wider VCS um, colleagues um, ensuring that we capitalise on existing opportunities because we know there's a lot of infrastructure that we haven't quite tapped into, but it would actually get us to, to reach some of those people. And I suppose um, from the previous conversation on, on, on the previous item, um, it's back to that communication and we know that there's there's lots of people not getting effective um, information communication because perhaps they're not using the the the, the media or, or some of the mechanisms that we're using so this would provide some additionality to be able to get the message out there. Um, I appreciate that's quite small and um, I'm not going to kind of read through it, but it was just to identify that there was um, a national piece of work that was done on this and, and these are some of the um, high level outcomes. Um, and, and really it says that community COVID champions um, are working and that's because um, there, there's a level of confidence um, by empowering our communities and, and key individuals in our communities. Um, it raises the confidence of people, it reassures them, it dispels myths, um, it gives accuracy. There was some context of how it's worked previously with with other pandemics um, and it also you know identifies how it's, it's affected within some of that wider prevention and control um, and we hope that we would be able to build on some of that context and some of the national benchmarking that we've done speaking to neighbouring local authorities but um, local authorities further afield as well and, and building on their good practice. Um, very quick visual, um, I'm no artist, but this was my attempt of just trying to identify perhaps where this, this would fit and how it would fit into a whole picture for community response. Um, we know our colleagues in the police are obviously dealing with um, you know, quite specific enforcement of, of legislation and, and um, issues that are arising due to the pandemic. Um, we hope that's on a, a lower scale and then we would start to increase um, engagement with the community as we work through. Um, we're working with how we can make sure that the information sharing um, throughout the whole um, function of, of each of the services um, increases and, and it's very good at the moment, but we can we can do that um, differently as, as time evolves. And then just to identify that there's um, other services that, that critically sit alongside that we would expect um, need a level of interaction. And there's also a lot of other work that's happening um, that we would ensure that especially the kind of community street ambassadors and the, the COVID champions fit into um, link to track and trace um, the, the plans around mass testing and, and potentially vaccines. We know that making every contact count, there's some opportunities there. Um, Better Health at Work Awards and actually some of our colleagues in other organisations very keen to see the implementation of champions, especially in their workplaces. Um, we know there's a lot that we need to link into around digital inc inclusion. And then we've got other really positive models of, of volunteering and engaging with with um, key communities through through the EPEC model that we can capitalise on that learning and ensure we we use those models as a, a way to start to implement. 
Um, and just very quickly, um, some suggested kind of next steps. Um, we're, we're working in the background to kind of plan and, and ensure that we can work through um, this in a timely manner because we appreciate, um, you know, we're, we're living in this pandemic right now. Um, so we're, we're looking at um, communication planning and obviously how we would we deal with with that um, side of things. And I'm working with colleagues um, in the authority. Um, we need to do some robust implementation planning and, and starting to look at who would we recruit and how would we phase this out um, so that we can test our model. Um, we would need to ensure that there's a mechanism for for kind of doing that brief across all of the functions from you know police right through to, to community and, and other services to interact. Um, we want to ensure that it's insight led. I know working with colleagues in public health, we're already um, using some of the insight to inform where community street ambassadors are being deployed at the moment, where we're seeing there's um, particular issues arising. Um, we, we're kind of deploying our teams there and that's working really well. We obviously need to respond to the changes as they happen, and we know that that will be ongoing for, for a short period and, and perhaps a medium period of time. Um, and then there's obviously some things on the horizon that we would need to look out for. And most importantly, this is about um, certainly supporting those most vulnerable in our communities, um, as, as well as the masses as well. Um, and we would ensure that what we're doing is, is impactful uh, and purposeful, and we're just creating a framework for us to be able to do that. Um, apologies, I'll just hopefully finish sharing. Hopefully that's finished. Um, thank you, Chair, and happy to take any questions. That's great. Thank you, Gemma. Uh, Councillor Harrison. Thanks, Chair. Um, hello, Gemma. <laughs> Long time no see. Um, I think um, I, I think that's great, and I think that would be very useful to send to all um, members as well, um, with, with perhaps a little explanation of what the acronyms mean, because you you've explained them as you've gone along, but there's no explanation in in the um, presentation. So so that would be really good. But if I could just um, come on to the track and trace, which is something which. Um, hopefully has improved since the community champions have, have been there um, and, and the, um, you, you know, what you've set in place. Um, uh, my, my opinion is that nationally, track and trace hasn't worked as well as it should have done from the beginning of the pandemic outbreak. Um, I, I think that had it, had it been more robust, um, we perhaps would not be in the position we are now. Um, so you know, can can you give us the assurances that it that it's working better, and um, that that it's that it is more robust? I mean, I'll give you a couple of examples, and don't think for one minute I've been going round all the pubs in Hartlepool because I don't, I haven't. Uh, but from what I glean from various um, other people who have gone round the pubs in Hartlepool, um, you go in, you know, you could have gone into one and been tracked and traced. Um, you, you go into another and it wasn't. So it wasn't consistent throughout those businesses. Um, I've gone to church when I could. That is brilliant. That is to me, and it's not because of God, but it's one of the safest places to be because of what they've put in. Um, the, there is track and tracing. Um, you, you can't get in without an appointment, as it were. You've got to book your place. So, it, you know, some places are very safe and do the track and tracing and other places aren't. Can you give any reassurances of, of how this can improve, has improved um, over the period of time, Gemma? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Brenda. Um, I, I don't want to pass the book on this one, but certainly um, I'm not leading on on track and trace. Okay. And, and obviously, um, these are much more kind of functions to be able to share key information and messaging. So I think probably Tony Hansen, not to, to throw it <laughs> along the line, but perhaps he'd be able to come in from a public protection perspective and update on that one. Right under the bus, Tony. <laughs> It's all right. I had put my hand up to assist if need 
needed. Um, yeah, in terms of the question, Councillor Harrison, yeah, we, we've spent a lot of time working with businesses since the start of this outbreak, um, or since the start of the pandemic, in terms of supporting them through some of the changes that they've had to make and to understand what the guidance was and what it meant for them. And um, that's meant that we've explained to them some of the things they need to do, the new processes, the new ways in which they have to work. Um, what we've always said is if if people aren't, or some businesses, sorry, aren't adhering to that guidance, then you know the public need to inform us of that and then obviously we will respond and um, we have taken enforcement action against businesses that have not complied with what they should be doing because as you said that creates a public health risk which we obviously need to manage um so where we have been notified of businesses who have failed to to adhere to the guidance or work with us and um, then we will take the necessary enforcement action but generally we we've been supportive of businesses as much as we can to ensure that everything they're putting in place is correct appropriate um, and support what we're all trying to do and trying to uh, come out this as quickly as we can. Thanks, Tony. Um, there's, there's just um, one more thing. When when some places do the track and trace, um, you, you've got to have an app on your phone. Many of us don't have apps or, or those particular kinds of phones. Um, and I think that uh, one of the things that we could perhaps do is to try and get them to make ensure that everybody can be tracked and traced, even if you haven't got an app on your phone. And I think it's unfair that if you haven't got that particular phone, you can't go in, into that that particular place. And um, so I, I think you know, pen and paper was okay in my day, and and still works. <laughs> Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you. Um, Christopher? Thank you, Chair. It was just a, a couple of things. One was in relation to the uh, implementation and the recruitment of the community champions. And as I've already offered before, bearing in mind, we sit like within the voluntary community sector as an organisation of Health Watch, and we already have a network of people. We have a volunteer steering group. So like, you know, I would welcome involvement in, and perhaps we could do a bit of a match, like, you know, some of our Health Watch members who are very, very active and they uh, previously, well, currently can't do things like enter and view inspections and we try and do them in a different way. So there's lots of people who are very keen to be involved and help, like, you know, with things. So the offers there and have, we can have a conversation outside of here, how we're able to assist with that. But the other item was, uh, and I've raised it pre previously at other meetings, and it's about the street ambassadors. And I would just urge, like, you know, to get the message out that groups of street ambassadors walking around together failing to show social distance isn't exactly the message that we need to be putting out there. And I think we just need to reinforce it because of our own street ambassadors aren't adhering to social distancing or, or wearing masks and things. It sort of like makes a mockery of the messaging that we're putting out. I think, um, Chair, if I can just respond, um, I'd really welcome the opportunity to um, look at how we can work with uh, certainly the, the Health Watch, he sorry, Health Watch network to be able to to kind of roll that champion training out, and it might be that we do that as a as a little bit of a pilot as well that would help us to inform some of our our model. Um, and um, in terms of, I've picked up the information previously, um, and and that's certainly been reinforced how um, our ambassador ambassadors are operating they go out in twos um and they um you know do that from a safety perspective um and and they certainly um are operating um what's slightly difficult is they're walking the streets for eight hours a day um so we've ensured that they're now taking breaks in and out of public eye space um so yeah uh, we'll we'll keep an eye on that one but yeah thanks appreciate it thank you Gemma. um anybody else Want to ask any questions or comments on this one? No. Okay. Thank you very much, Gemma, Tony. Um, is this you again, Gemma, for the support hub and uh, CEV update? Yes, Chair. Yeah. Great. 
Um, I circulated a, a very high level report just to update on um, the response so far to those that are clinically extremely vulnerable. Um, the background gives some context to um, how we've operated so far um, within Hartlepool Support Hub, um, certainly considering when we were uh, in a period of shielding. Um, so the background in 2.2 in gives some context to um, the first response of the Support Hub um, and what we achieved during that time. And then identified because of that um, impact, but also progressing quite significantly with our uh, community led support model and um, the support hub has been sustained um, and it continues to respond not only to the pandemic, but also to um, start to look at how we're operating um, for um, the adult social care and, and becoming a little bit of a front door to ensure that everybody's got a level of community led support um, as well as social care support. Um, as we approached a, a second national lockdown in October, um, we know that the term shielding ended um, and it was replaced with, with those that were clinically extremely vulnerable um, and the guidance that was associated to that was slightly different, um, although it still identified a level of um, minimising contact, it, it didn't stop people from leaving their houses completely. Um, when shielding paused in August 2020, uh, we did a significant amount of work, especially with our high risk um, individuals who we knew we were supporting on a regular basis. There was about 500 of those um, from about 4,500 people that we knew were on that list, um, but many of them having uh, personal infrastructures of support. So with that 500 people, we were able to do some quite significant person-centred planning and identifying how people could um, reduce the reliance on services long term, but also ensure they had the right um, support um, mechanisms in place to, to move forward. Um, that has significantly helped. Um, as we went into a, a second national lockdown, we were able to make contact um, with all of our uh, clinically extremely vulnerable. And I suppose just to reiterate back to that communication planning, you know, we have now access to, um, you know, four and a half thousand of our, our most vulnerable people in the population. And we're maintaining regular contact with those people to ensure that they know we're there. We're sharing clear information on what they need to do to keep safe. Um, and reiterating some of those messages. So for example, as we're going to Christmas, we're continuing to reinforce um, what we would like people to do to keep them as safe as possible. Um, we know that there was about 200 that came back to us that were of our highest risk. Um, quite surprisingly, um, that number was low because people had really put some, some good networks of support in place through our person-centered approach in the first instance. Um, and we've often um, seen that people have come back to us to support them to access the National Shields and Service System um, um, to ensure that they could get access to priority shopping um, slots, NHS responder services um, and other things. The demand on the hub has been low during the second lockdown when we're looking at it from a, a food perspective. We've only um, distributed three to five um, food um, parcel provisions each week and this has been on an emergency measure. The priority was around access to food, not provide enough food. So we've been able to create um, good mechanisms to ensure that people have a sustainable um, access to food on an ongoing basis. A lot of the demand that we've seen come through in the second lockdown um, has been around isolation and um, ill mental health. Um, and we've been able to support people um, to get access to specialist services where needed, signpost out, but also we've created quite a significant um, social and digital inclusion package to make sure that people um, are able to keep connected. Um, we know that um, digital technology and uh, connectivity has been a really real challenge throughout the pandemic. So as we came out of um, the first lockdown, we did a huge piece of work to apply for some external funding to say that we need to get more people digitally connected. So we've been able to um, get two digital development officers on a fixed term basis. We're working with colleagues in the VCS, um, for example, Project 65, to get tablet loaning programmes, to get people the skills and understanding of being able to use those. And we're also looking at working with um, colleagues through the VCS around a community broadband programme um, that will ensure that we get more people online, which, which starts to reduce um, some of the challenges that we have um, for people accessing information. Um, and even things like healthcare cons consultations, um, we know that that's been a challenge throughout this. People haven't been attending their healthcare um, appointments or able to have access to those. So we've been able to put things in place to ensure that that can happen. 
Um, the calls received have been extremely low in the second lockdown, but that's because we work on a much more proactive approach as well. So although there was um, th 366 calls received um, between the time that, that we've, we've measured for um, the period that I, I developed this report, we know that almost a thousand calls have been made because we know those that need the support. Um, we continue to work with our colleagues at Mecca Bingo who um, remain on, on furlough and remain close to the public. So they've been um, providing hot meals and we've distributed approximately 50 hot meals on a daily basis, um, mainly to those most vulnerable that would have had access to day provision and a hot meal. Um, so we've sustained that. And we've also put a robust plan in place to support those um, most in need over Christmas. We know it's going to be an extremely challenging time for some people. Um, so our services um, will be operating as much as we can over that period. Um, and next week's going to be extremely busy getting people um, gifts, food hampers. And we've also um, been able to make a local arrangement to get people a hot Christmas dinner delivered to them on Christmas Day, which also means they'll have contact with somebody um, and that wouldn't have been possible without working with local businesses and local volunteering community. So the recommendations is, is for um, colleagues and, and members to be aware of, of what our future, future plans are working with um, this group, uh, the priority linked to digital inclusion and also um, that social engagement and positive mental health. Um, we're continuing to work on the um, opportunity of uh, a digital development program with colleagues in the NHS and there's also a really robust digital um, engagement program with our voluntary and community sector colleagues. Um, there is further consideration that could be given to kind of um, whole system planning linked to our um, uh, individuals in the community that are a class of CV and we also want to ensure that there's um, real acknowledgement and planning from all of our perspective around those that are critically vulnerable that don't actually hit the um, the, the ability to access the infrastructure that supports those that are clinically extremely vulnerable and um, so therefore um, they're missing out at times and we saw that with some of the prescription networks when um, pharmacies had to deliver to those that were clinically extremely vulnerable um, it did result in some of those critically vulnerable removed from the list um, and others prioritised um, and the, the fallout of that came to the local authority. So we're working with colleagues right across the, the um, health partnerships as well to ensure those that are critically vulnerable aren't missing out on those services. Um, and it was just to acknowledge the uh, future plan and our community-led support model um, and the fact that that's been accelerated and that moving into 2021, we are exploring that we will become the um, front door for adult social care to ensure that we can provide um, a real quality of support um, so that people are, are safe and well, but we also ensure quality of life. Um, and we try and do that through a, a community-led offer as well as a social care offer. Thank you, Chair. That's great. Thank you very much for that, um, Jenna. I think it, it's plain to see for everybody the, the absolute benefits that we were able to um, deliver with the support of, especially during the first lockdown period. Um, but I think for me, what's, what's been really good to see is that the positive to come out of all of this madness this year is that we have been able to progress with a lot of the uh, support hub stuff that you wanted to do and the, the schemes that uh, we'll be able to progress um, moving forward with and, and carry those on. And I think it, it just, it'll enhance the service that we're able to give um, to some of the most vulnerable people as we need to. So that's great. Um, is there any other questions or comments from uh, anybody on the call? Councillor Harrison. Yeah, just to echo what you've said there, Shane, I think that um, the work that's been done throughout this period to help our more vulnerable people has been very commendable. And I think that that needs to go on record and long may it continue. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Brenda. Stephen? Thank you, Chair, and uh, I would echo what uh, Brenda has just said, and I think that uh, our support hubs have really come into their own during uh, the pandemic period and have done uh, some fantastic work to support some of the, uh, the most vulnerable uh, people out there within our communities. And just sort of like just following on from the, uh, from the presentation, and certainly uh, mental health is uh, a real key area of concern um as the pandemic progresses and i just wonder if uh, uh 
uh, Gemma, you could just develop a little bit around some of the uh, support that uh, is being made available to people who are experiencing some mental health difficulties during the course of the pandemic and how we are linking in with uh, some of our partners in the community and voluntary sector uh, to uh, enable people to access some of the uh, support services that, uh, that they provide. Thank you. Um, thank you, Councillor Harrison, for, for your comments and, and, and thank you, Councillor Thomas. Um, in terms of, of what we're doing in response to uh, the, the ill mental health that we're seeing, it is very person centred. Um, and on that basis, there isn't one particular um, aspect of that we're promoting and um, we are working very closely with what the offer is within the community and um, again depending on um, who the individual is and, and what they're experiencing and what services they're already accessing will depend on the response that we're providing. Um, we, we know that there's um, a huge amount of support out there um, but with some people actually providing them with um, connectivity, advice around financial um, well-being um, through our commission contract with Westview Advice and Resource Centre, um, giving people access to that technology, ensuring that people are, are following up with the healthcare appointments, um, is actually providing some of that response. So it isn't always necessarily mental health services that we're referring them to or getting them to access. Um, it's providing them with a package of support to deal with the issues that they're experiencing. Um, one of the positive developments that, that certainly needs more exploration, so I can't give any huge context on it today, but we are working with our colleagues in um, Tuve, um, the, the TZ Esquire Valley Foundation Trust, um, who are really keen to progress with um, a community um, hub model ultimately and obviously we have a community hub infrastructure already available so we're, we're in very close um, discussion with, with them and, and our colleagues in adult social care to see how we can um, really embed something uh, within um, an already um, sustained support hub mechanism but bringing in um, mental health as one of the services as part of that um, so I'm not sure if that answers your question because really the response is quite vast and, and we are person planning and um, we are using all of those wonderful services around us um, across health and voluntary sector as well as what we have available to us within our organisation um, and, and we are really making an impact um, and really kind of um, you know, an example was a, a gentleman who was was completely isolated, experiencing um, extremely low mood. Um, we had our digital officers take a, a tablet loan to him. Um, we got him uh, downloaded a number of apps um, on on hobbies, you know, crossword apps and different things. We got a call with his family that live in a different part of the country, um, and he had that on a daily basis for the time he had the tablet. Um, and after five days, he came back to us and said, "Can we support him to purchase a tablet? Because it's one of the best things that's ever happened." Um, and it, before he would have never taken that leap because he didn't have the access, he didn't have the skills, he didn't have the knowledge. Um, and and he didn't believe it was the right thing for him. So, you know, from a five day intervention of support and access to some of the, the technology and connectivity that we know is is, is able to make a difference. Um, he's now reporting, we've, we've called him regularly, but he's now reporting that, that he feels fabulous and um, his, you know, his mental well-being is improving. So th that's just one example. And, you know, that's not a referral to any mental well-being services. It, it's, it's just giving him something that he needs and we're facilitating and supporting them. Thanks for that, Chairman. I think that's really reassuring because I think, as you said, uh, mental health issues are really varied and uh, very individual in their nature. And I think having that sort of person-centred approach to the support that you're providing and the way in which you're working with people is uh, fundamental uh, in, uh, in in working with and supporting people going forward. But just a couple of other areas. One of the things that we've heard quite a lot about this week is uh, the impact that um, the lockdown and COVID has had on uh, missed operations for hips, knees, those sorts of things. And uh, we're talking about a two to three year backlog now, two to three years to catch up on missed appointments. And are any of those issues coming through amongst the uh, people that you are working with and supporting? And one particular area of concern I have going into the winter period is uh, an increase in uh, falls amongst some of our vulnerable people as uh, nine months of not being able to um, 
probably exercise and get around in the way in which they normally would uh, is a recipe for increased falls. And uh, I'm just wondering if there's any work being done uh, to um, promote some of the things that people can do to avoid falls amongst the uh, vulnerable, vulnerable group that uh, we're working with. And the last one is about the rollout of the flu vaccine. Uh, how is that being rolled out to some of our more vulnerable people that we're supporting? Thank you, Councillor Thomas. Um, just in um, response to your first point, um, absolutely, you know, the impact on missed appointments and especially the, the, um, the level of um, low physical activity we're seeing from, from some of, of those um, residents and, and the impact that's having on their strength and um, therefore then increasing their risk of falls is significant. Um, we're doing some really exciting work at the minute with the Foundation Trust and their physio department. Um, some of it's in response to the Active Hospitals um, program. We've been identified as one of three national sites for um, active hospitals, um, and I'm taking a, a report on that to Adult and Community-Based Services Committee um, next week. Um, what we're able to do with that is work with their, um, one of the priorities is around frailty and also um, musculoskeletal conditions. So we're starting to work with their physio around how can we create a pathway um, for those that are an inpatient and then into outpatients and then into the community. So we know that there's a real opportunity there for us to be able to support people. And one of the things that we've asked um, to work with the physio department on is, is around prehabilitation. So we know where people aren't able to access those operations that they need. It's about being able to work with them and provide them with, with the strength, strength and conditions that means that they are supported in advance of their operation. They're, they're also supported um, in ensuring that, that it will help in the recovery um, post operation. So um, we're doing some of that work and we're linking in with their mood, move and medicine programme. Um, in addition to that, we're just um, working with our wellbeing team on um, being able to um, provide some access to information, whether that's through um, information leaflets, short videos, live streaming. Um, we're able to kind of get those short kind of um, information sessions to people who aren't accessing any of our, uh, what would have been our GP referral programming at the moment to ensure that we'll still be able to get people um, that, that information. We've also just been able to kind of secure some um funding to be able to um, purchase two um, the motor med cycles that were previously based within our leisure centres and people were accessing on a regular basis um, to be able to increase their, their strength and conditioning. Um, these are now mobile um, items that we're going to be able to support people to get access to in their homes and, and loan these for a period of time. Um, and we know and we've we've seen that some of um, the individuals that were using these before, especially where they were recovering from stroke and your, your wider neurophysiological conditions, um, they've seen quite a significant reduction in their physical well-being. So we're, we're now working on how do we get this information, this access and this support to people that actually need it um, on a, a, a regular basis. What a time for my doorbell to go. I do apologise. <laughs> <laughs> um completely through me and i apologize but i hope that answers some of um the the first question and then in terms of flu vaccines we've we've worked with our hartlepool and stockton health uh we've worked with hash to ensure that we supported a community-based approach to flu vaccinations uh, we finished the first round of that and we're now in discussions with them about how we can support a second round of that um and we're not sure of the statistics on it and i know that craig is is quite closely linked in and and is attending the flu board um i'm, I'm I've got some time in with Craig to look at how we can facilitate and support any of that work. Um, apologies for the interruption. Thanks, Gemma. That's a very full and comprehensive answer there. And it really is reassuring that that work is going on to support some of our most vulnerable residents. And I think one thing that needs to happen as we move forward, hopefully coming out of COVID, is I think there is some excellent practice developing which will lend itself to uh, more normal times once we move on beyond COVID. And I hope there is a thorough uh, analysis of, uh, of that uh, practice and learning that's come out of some of the work that you've been doing, and that's rolled forward. Thank you. Julian? 
Thank you, Chair. Um, the moment may have passed, but I just wanted to pick up on a point that Gemma made, well, her story, in fact, about the transformation in that, that gentleman's mental health as a result of such a simple emphasis. And that is that the importance of a social model of mental health and that very often the last thing that people need are, quote, mental health services and certainly not medication. They need to have their emotional needs met. Uh, and Gemma's story really highlights well how such a simple intervention, which allows that person to get their need for some meaning and purpose and a sense of achievement through their crosswords or whatever hobbies they have and to connect with their family and meet their needs for emotional connection is transformative for mental health. So just to applaud that approach and also to acknowledge the the vision of the council in working collaboratively with the VCS amongst others in developing a model of commissioning social care that acknowledges that uh, broader understanding of, of well-being. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Julian. Uh, thank you, Gemma. Uh, there's nobody else. Um, so the recommendations in the, the report that Gemma provided um, is basically just to uh, to note everything and if we're all happy. Sounds like we are. Yeah. We'll move on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gemma. Um, there isn't any other business that I need to bring forward today, but I would just, if I could, ah, Greg's put his hand up, so that's quite handy anyway. Uh, I was going to ask what what the priority, especially from the council's standpoint and officers, what's your priority for our partners who are here today? What message do we want to be stressing the most um, through as many means as possible in the run up to Christmas and um, and beyond? I'll go to Craig first. Thanks, Chair. Chair, can, um, I jump in? Chair, Chair, can I just jump in for a moment because it does relate to the last item and uh, I'd just like to ask that uh, we could um, ask Gemma to pass on uh, this group's thanks to uh, the Support Hub staff for the work that they have done during the pandemic and uh, for the difference that they have made to so many people's lives during uh, the course of this very difficult time that we've been living in. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, any I mean anything that that has been fed back, which has been um, you know wonderfully supportive to kind of keep morale high and feeding back. And you know, there's a real significant um, thanks to to Lee Keeble, um, who kind of heads up that service, and and she's fabulous um, and and really deserves a high level of acknowledgement throughout all of this. So absolutely, um, I always feed it back. But thank you. Yes, I will. I will make sure that happens. Thanks, Gemma. OK, Craig. Thanks, Chair. I think it's going back to the messages I was mentioning before, and I think that we need to be reinforcing reinforcing the standard messages that we've got now about social distancing, about good hand hygiene, about mask wearing where appropriate. But also, I think as we move into the um, Christmas period to um, really be pushing the message that we can't let our guard down, that push the message that we still need to to be socially distancing. And even if that means that some people are deciding to visit family to keep the distancing going, keep the hand hygiene going, um, but that we would really stress that you know, um, we are coming into a difficult period and that if people can avoid visiting or mixing households even within the guidelines, I think that's what we would recommend doing. Um, you know, it's it's a small sacrifice, as I've said before, to, to do that over the Christmas period. And we've had... Um, we have had a long haul to get here and we know people are, 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 are weary and, and getting for COVID fatigue as well about that. But we, you know, it, it's it's just one last push, I think, to, to make sure that we get through the winter period um, and get uh, enough time for the vaccines to start filtering through into the, the community as well. We know that's going to take a while. So whilst we've had all of the publicity this week around the vaccination programme, it's not a panacea at the moment. It's going to take a while for all of the communities to be vaccinated. Uh, it could be at least into the next six, six, nine, 12 months. So, um, you know, I don't want people to, to come away with the impression that um, everything's going to be back to normal really quickly because it isn't. Um, my biggest worry is a spike after Christmas. Uh, I don't want to see that in Hartlepool. Um, we're driving the figures down at the moment, and I think really we just need to be reinforcing those 
those positive messages around about the distancing, around about the mixing. And I think fundamentally, um, this virus is spread by social contact. So we need to restrict that as best we can going forward. And I know it's uh, it's kind of not a, a brilliant message for, for everyone to hear. But I think, you know, we don't want to undo the good work that's gone on so far. That's great. Thank you, Craig. Um, Pete? Chair, just from a placing perspective, um, we're very much trying to keep it still as engagement, encouragement and education. Um, we do have lots of calls for move down down the enforcement route, um, but I'm conscious that people's finances have been affected, their lives have been affected the last 12 months, so I'm trying to keep it as, as engaged as I possibly can. But moving forward, we might have to start to consider more enforcement, but it's something I'm trying to stay away from. Okay. Thanks, Pete. That's really useful. Thank you. Okay, that's all then. Thank you very much. Um, the date of the next meeting is the 12th of January. So in the meantime, please do everybody. Uh, Craig, we want to come back in there. Sorry, yes, just one small point just to flag up, just to change to the guidance as well, which I think might be um, useful for people okay. to know, um, which has literally just come in while the meeting was um, ongoing. And it's uh, a change to the isolation periods, which I think possibly might help um, as we go forward. Um, as from Monday, anyone who's been a contact of a case um, will only have to isolate for 10 days rather than the 14. So I think it's, it's possibly, you know, something more, positive for for people to 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 see i mean it's still a 10 days is still um a, a substantial chunk of time but it will be shorter for contacts so that's great thank you craig um well that's it then on that note thank you all very much for your attendance take care of yourselves look after one another and more importantly have a lovely christmas socially distanced socially distanced <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.